Hey guys, this is Keith with CADSharp.com, and I'll be your guide on this journey into the SOLIDWORKS API. So to start off, what is the SOLIDWORKS API? Well, API stands for Application Programming Interface, and many applications, not just SOLIDWORKS, have an API. Uh, for example, all of the Microsoft Office products have an API, and in fact, you might have already created macros and uh, programs like Microsoft Excel. But basically, an API is going to let users in some way automate tasks within that program. So one of the most common ways to do that is by recording macros and then replaying those macros. However, you're pretty limited in what you can do with a macro recorder. So typically, then you'll need to move on to actually editing the code, and that's where knowledge of programming comes in. So most serious API work is done uh, with using programming, and it's no different uh, with the SOLIDWORKS API. So in this series, I'm going to introduce you to uh, some basic programming and the basics of using the SOLIDWORKS API so you can start automating your own workflow. Now, I want to go over three ways that I've seen the SOLIDWORKS API used in SOLIDWORKS. And the first way, and perhaps the most common way amongst novice API users, is just to create a macro that speeds up a repetitive task. So let's say, for example, you want a macro that is able to switch the units on a dimension between millimeter and inches when you click on it. If you were to do that manually, it might take a few uh, clicks of the mouse to get there, but with a macro, you could just click on the dimension, run the macro shortcut, and you're done. So uh, that's certainly a possible use for a macro, but it's really not that significant. I mean, at the end of the day, you've shaved a few minutes off, and, and that's great, but this isn't something that's really going to affect the company's bottom line or anything like that. Second, I've also seen the API used to reduce error. So let's say that after you create a drawing, you have to save the drawing and then also save out a PDF. So you might write a macro that does both at the same time to prevent you from forgetting to save out the PDF. And so in that way, you are uh, not only speeding up the task, but you are um, preventing the likelihood that you'll make an error. And then the third way, and the most significant way that I see the API used is workflow automation. And this is where you're not simply speeding up a simple repetitive task, but you're actually taking a large chunk of your, your workflow and figuring out some way that it can be automated, maybe in a way that both you and many of your coworkers can greatly reduce the number of hours they spend on a certain part of their job. And this kind of usage of the API is where not only can you start to really affect your company's bottom line, but you can also really set yourself apart as an employee because you have a serious skill that you're using to make yourself and your coworkers a lot more efficient. So out of those three uses, even if you came here just hoping to speed up a few smaller parts of your workflow, I'd encourage you to think big and think of some way that maybe a larger part of your workflow could be improved by using the API. So in other words, I'm saying aim high. Don't try to limit yourself because the API is very, very powerful. Now also note that you can use the API in the form of macros or add-ins. And if you've ever used any CAM package or maybe any electrical package, you were probably using something that was written as an add-in. And that's definitely the more complicated of the two. So we're not going to do add-ins in this series. Instead, we're just going to focus on macros, which definitely have as much power as we need for what we intend to accomplish in this series. All right, so what are we going to cover in this series? Well, to start off, we are going to look at the macro recorder for a little bit, and I will show you its usages and its limitations. Then after that, we're actually going to start creating a macro from scratch, and I'll sh demonstrate uh, what the final version of that will be in a moment. But basically, as we create it from scratch, I'm going to expose you to what I consider to be the three pillars of serious API programming or basically the three skills that you need to know if you ever want to be a serious user of the SOLIDWORKS API. And those are first programming using SOLIDWORKS Visual Basic for Applications, then also using the SOLIDWORKS API help. That's basically 
what you're going to use in order to know what you need to type as code. And then third, understanding the SOLIDWORKS API object model. And the object model is basically how the SOLIDWORKS API is set up so you know how to get what you want out of it. And I know that's a little vague, but you'll understand it more in a moment. Now, I want to warn you that if you don't try to learn those three skills before embarking upon a serious macro, then you're going to be very, very frustrated. And a lot of people don't know that they need to learn those things starting off. And so as a result, they get frustrated and quit pretty early. But I want to prevent that today. I want you to learn those three skills and then have confidence as you learn more about the SOLIDWORKS API and create increasingly complex macros. So before we get started, let me just show you the finished product of this series. Uh, right now I have this part open uh, that you should have been able to download from the files that come with the series. And if I run the finished version of the macro, I'll get this user form that says enter whole diameter in millimeters. And so let's just enter a value like 20. And when I click this add configuration button, basically it's going to add a new configuration to this part and the configuration will be named uh, whatever I have input in here, so 20, and it will change these whole wizard hole diameters to 20 millimeters. Also, if I have create drawing turned on, then it's also going to open up a pre-existing drawing I have that doesn't have any views on it, and it's going to add a three view layout of the new configuration to that sheet, and then it's going to insert um, the model dimensions. It's also going to save out the drawing and then save out the drawing as a DXF. So let's try this out right now. Okay, so there's our three view layout. And let's close out of this. There is our new configuration and we'll go ahead and close out of this. And in your version, I'll also show you how to save uh, the new version of that part. And if I go into the folder then where the files are stored, you'll see that the DXF and the new drawing file were saved along with the original model. So that's the finished version of what we're going to create in this series. Now let's go ahead and get started looking at the macro recorder. And as I alluded to before, the macro recorder is a good place to start for novice API users because it doesn't necessarily require you to use any programming to work with the API. So to work with the macro recorder or any of the macro tools, in fact, you can go to tools, uh, macro, and then there's edit, new, record, run, stop, which I'll explain more in a moment. However, while you're outside of SOLIDWORKS and when you're in each document, um, if you want to get the toolbar up, then you can go to the command manager, right click, and go to macro. And I like to keep it down here in the corner. I don't care where you put it. Just do whatever is comfortable for you, but this is where I will have it. So basically the buttons related to the macro recorder are over on the left side. There's play, stop, and record. And then once we start actually programming uh, macros from scratch, we'll be using these two buttons over here, new macro and edit macro. So let's start over here on the left then. Let's click record. And as soon as I click record, the macro recorder is going to start recording my actions. So what I'm going to do now is just open up a new part and create a block. And I would encourage you to test this out on your own as well. So open up a sketch on the front plane and I'll just put a circle and I'm not even going to dimension it. And I'm just going to go to my shortcut toolbar and go into extrude and extrude out an arbitrary length. Click OK. And I'll even hit uh, my zoom to fit button. And then I'll click stop. And when I click stop, you get this dialog box asking you where you want to save it. And this is important because this is where we choose the save as type. If you drop this down, you'll see that there's a few different options and these different options correspond to the different languages available to record a macro in. 
And the one that we're going to be using is VBA, Visual Basic for Applications, which I mentioned earlier. And the reason we're going to use VBA is, uh, first of all, it's the easiest language to learn of the other types. And the other types are VB.NET and C Sharp. So VBA is definitely the easiest to learn among them. It's also the most commonly used. So that means that most of the examples you find in the API help and out on the internet are going to be in VBA. So that's also an advantage if you're a beginner. Another advantage is that with the VBA macro, everything you need to work with a macro is just in one file. Whereas with the others, it's actually in a folder with many files. So it's also a lot simpler. So all around, you can see that VBA is a good place to start. That being said, I get the question a lot, since VBA is the oldest of these languages, isn't there a concern that pretty soon it might be obsolete and so I really sh shouldn't start investing so much time in learning what could soon be a dead language? And my response to that is, no, that's not a concern. And the reason is, even though VBA is based on Visual Basic, which was created back in the mid-90s, um, Microsoft is going to keep it around for a long time because it's still the language they use with their Microsoft Office products, and so they keep supporting it. And in fact, uh, just in the past couple years, they came out with a new version of VBA, and in fact, SolidWorks 2013 has that newest version as well. So this is a language that Microsoft is actively supporting, and SolidWorks will continue supporting it as well. And if they didn't, that'd be a huge problem because then a massive amount of legacy macros would no longer work. So there's a lot of incentive to keep it up and running. So with that being explained about uh, language, just make sure that you're on VBA, which will have the extension SWP, and then feel free to enter whatever uh, name you want, but I'm just gonna use the default one and click save. So now that I have this macro recorded, let's go back to where we started. So I'm going to close out of this part and we're back to the home screen. And now let's go down to run. So run an already recorded macro. And again, make sure that this dropdown is on VBA, otherwise you won't see the macro you just recorded. And then double click on that macro. And as you expected, it basically repeated the steps that we performed when we were recording the macro. So now at this point, you might be thinking, Keith, that was really simple and we didn't have to involve programming at all. So why don't we just keep going with this? Why don't we just stick with the macro recorder and that way I don't have to learn any basic programming? Well, there's several reasons why we don't want to rely on the macro recorder. And the first reason is that even though the macro recorder successfully was able to create a cylinder for us, it actually can't go real far beyond this in terms of complexity. So for example, let's say that I tried to record myself adding a new custom property. Well, you'd find that when you tried to replay that macro that uh, the new custom property wouldn't be added. The reason is that the macro recorder simply doesn't know how to record those actions for whatever reason. So right there's a limitation. The macro recorder cannot record certain actions, and that's a big problem. Second of all, using the macro recorder, you can't implement any logic. So let's say that you wanted a macro that, depending on whether the face you clicked was cylindrical or planar, the face would become either blue or red. Well, that would require conditional logic. You know, if planar, then blue, if cylindrical, then red, or something like that. There's no way to incorporate that while recording actions. Likewise, there's really no way to include user input. So earlier when I was able to specify a dimension for the whole wizard, there's no way when I record myself to give myself the ability to choose each time. So in either case, the macro is always just going to do the same thing over and over and over again. So we're very limited. A fourth thing I don't like about the macro recorder is that the code it records is actually very messy and poorly formatted. So if we come down here and go to edit and browse for the macro we recorded, then when we open it up, we see this. And right now at this point, if you haven't done anything with the SolidWorks API, this might look like Chinese to you. But really that's not the case. If you look closely at a lot of it, you'll, you will see that it is kind of intuitive. So, you know, for example, in this line where it says new document, well, as you probably guessed, that's the line where the new document is created. 
And if we move down a little bit further, we might see this select by ID2, and we might see this front plane after it. And you might think, OK, that's the line where the front plane is selected. And so on and so forth. Right here is create circle. And then moving down here, this is feature extrusion. So that's when the circle is created and the, the sketch is extruded. So there are parts of this code that are intuitive. Nevertheless, this is not what your code is going to look like when you create it from scratch. Um, there's really poor formatting going on here. There's a lot of unnecessary lines that don't, don't need to be in here. And just in general, what they have in here that's produced automatically is pretty ugly. Nevertheless, since you are a novice API user, there are some uses to the macro recorder. So for example, a big part of you using the SOLIDWORKS API is going to be figuring out what code to type in to get what you want. Well, sometimes you're going to have trouble finding that code in the API help. So why not just record a macro of you doing, you know, just one thing, like for example, creating a new drawing and then opening up that macro you recorded and then taking a look at the line where it was recorded and maybe copying that line into your macro to see if it works. So that is a use of the macro recorder. You can uh, basically learn what API calls, as they're called, need to be used to perform a certain task. Again, as I mentioned, the macro recorder oftentimes cannot record certain actions, so that won't always work for you. You'll just have to try it out on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's actually leave the macro recorder now and start creating from scratch uh, this macro I demonstrated to you earlier. So let's go ahead and close out of this window that popped up when we edited the macro. And go ahead and click no if something comes up there. And then let's also get out of this part. And let's go ahead and open up the part that you should have downloaded called support.sld. PRT and here we are back where we started.